And good evening and welcome back to Harvard Hillel and our ongoing series uh, online. Uh, it is my pleasure this evening to uh, welcome and introduce Dr. Michael Osterholm. Dr. Osterholm, it's a pleasure to meet you uh, virtually here in person. Uh, Dr. Osterholm is Regents Professor McKnight Presidential Endowed Chair in Public Health, the Director of the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy, Distinguished Teaching Professor in the Division of Environment, Environmental Health Sciences School of Public Health, a professor in the Technological Leadership Institute, College of Science and Engineering, and an adjunct professor in the medical school, all at the University of Minnesota. He is the author of the 2017 book, Deadliest Enemy, Our War Against Killer Germs, in which he not only details the most pressing infectious disease threats of our day, but lays out a nine-point strategy on how to address them with preventing a global flu pandemic at the top of the list. I know, Dr. Ostholm, uh, I first encountered you at the beginning of March. I believe you were on the Joe Rogan podcast. Uh, and this was before really anyone was paying a lot of attention to uh, coronavirus. Uh, it was just budding. And you made some pretty dire predictions. And Joe Rogan has uh, kind of a mixture of, uh, of guests. And I wasn't sure, you know, some are real experts, some can be uh, a little bit nutty. And I wasn't sure so much about you. And then I looked up your credentials and saw that you were the real deal. And then in the following few days, even weeks, uh, many of your predictions have unfortunately uh, come true. And then I was able to read your book. Uh, it really is a pleasure uh, to have you with us this evening. You've become really, in my mind, uh, the most trusted expert on coronavirus. So thank you so much for taking the time to join us here uh, this evening. I've just asked you to unmute yourself. Hopefully you can do that. There, there we go. Thank you. Welcome. Well, thank you very much. It's good to be with you. I appreciate it. Great, thank you. Uh, so I just want to begin if you can, by asking if you can give us an update on where we currently stand. Uh, how surprised are you about how the virus has progressed since we first became aware of it? And where do you think we're headed in the coming months? Well, unfortunately, I, I wish I could say that uh, we're in a different place than we are today. Um, today we set a new record, again, reported cases, 62,000 new cases reported today. Uh, we are largely experiencing a coronavirus uh, forest fire through a number of states in this country, particularly the southern states and some of the western areas. Uh, and this is not really, or should it be, surprising that this is happening. Uh, I think uh, the United States got done dealing with the virus before the virus got done dealing with us. And uh, what's happened is, is that as much as we uh, were able to suppress uh, the virus transmission during a period when we were in a sense what some call a lockdown uh, where we really advocated distancing, uh, we did a lot to bring uh, this virus transmission down, but we didn't do nearly enough to really get it to the point where we could control it with testing and contact tracing like has been done in other countries around the world. Um, we opened back up, we got impatient uh, we felt that uh, I guess our policies or our persuasion could uh, convince the virus to stay dormant and now we're paying a price. Um, we are at a point right now where uh, we're continuing to see transmission initially uh, in younger adults, uh, but now uh, transmission is occurring now to older individuals again, uh, people with underlying health problems. Uh, we're seeing the desk dry, uh, dr climb rather dramatically over the course of the last three to four days. Uh, as we know, deaths obviously tail the number of new cases sometimes by two to three weeks, so that uh, the real impact of that won't be seen until uh, probably another seven to 12 days. Um, I think the bottom line message is we're at an inflection point in this pandemic. Um, some would say we'll never go back to lockdown. Um, I don't know how we're going to get virus levels down to one to two per 100,000 population per day, which is really a level that would make it possible so that we could do what many other countries have done, uh, where they now can basically uh, live with this virus in some kind of uh, uh, constant battle, but one where society can largely go about doing what it's been doing. Um, and right now we're in trouble. The other area I would just add is our healthcare services are under tremendous pressure right now. Um, you know, one of the real unsung heroes in all of this that is often forgotten, we're now approaching over 1,000 healthcare workers in this country have died from COVID-19. Um, many of those were occupationally acquired. Um, you know, this is as much as any war in terms of when you look at the impact of that. But equally important is, of course, we're seeing many patients dying from COVID-19 
and also the data are clear and compelling that wherever you have a stretched healthcare service, like we're seeing in many parts of the country right now, people have heart attacks, people have strokes, people who need cancer treatment, uh, uh, unintentional injuries, et cetera, all are suffering miserably because of the compromised healthcare that occurs in a community where they're basically the house is on fire. So this is a real challenge and um, I'm not sure uh, what part of leadership, what part of science, what part of convincing that we all need to bring to the table to change the course. But if we don't, uh, things are only gonna grow uh, more dire here, at least in the United States. Some of the initial predictions we saw were as many as 2 million would die from coronavirus. If we don't have another lockdown, do you think we're headed uh, to numbers that might be that catastrophic? I don't know if 2 million is as high. Uh, you know, I've suggested 800,000 to over a million uh, cases where we'd have deaths. Uh, I think one of the things that's happened that has been favorable is we've gotten better at treating these cases. You know, uh, COVID-19 is one of the most complex diseases I've ever seen in my career. And it rivals in many ways the complications and immunologic aspects that we see with uh, HIV. Uh, we learned a tremendous amount the immunology of humans with HIV. And I think we're learning a tremendous amount about a number of different issues related to this uh, virus and what it does. Um, and so early on, uh, you know, we had 70, 80% of our patients uh, in this country who are on mechanical ventilators dying. Today, that number's come down dramatically. I give great credit to the ICU care in this country where a lot has been learned in very short order. And even without miracle drugs, you know, Redimzivir is surely a important drug. Uh, dexamethasone is a very important drug, uh, but uh, just better care in general uh, in terms of understanding uh, as much as we can about the pathology of this disease. So I, I think it's gonna be less than that, but it is still nonetheless going to be a, a really uh, significant issue. And I would just leave, I think, with one last thought as we get into this discussion. Uh, the serologic studies we've done in this country, for that matter, around the world, support that probably about 7% of the United States uh, has been infected with this virus. Uh, that includes places like New York, where it's much higher, other places it's lower, but about 7%. When you think about the fact that uh, from a standpoint of developing herd immunity, which likely would occur somewhere between 50 and 70% where the virus transmission will just slow down after we hit that level, it doesn't mean it'll stop. When you think about where we're at now at 7%, what it'll take to get to 50 to 70%, um, that's a really very, very sobering thought. With all the pain, suffering, death, and economic disruption that's occurred to date, we're still just getting started with this virus. And that's what I worry about most people to understand that yet. Mm. There was a editorial in the Wall Street Journal earlier this week that claimed that we might be closer to herd immunity uh, than is typically assumed or the numbers that you just mentioned, uh, primarily because of T-cell immunity. Uh, do you agree with this? How likely is it that, uh, that we may actually be closer to herd immunity than people might be thinking? Well, you know, we're in one of those situations right now, is the glass half empty, half full, or is there even a glass? Uh, what I mean by that is, is that clearly that is an important point about T cell immunity uh, and what role it might play. But again, you have to be infected with this coronavirus. And uh, some would say, well, maybe it's the other coronaviruses that are circulating around that will give you some immunity. Uh, you know, I'm not a coronavirus uh, virologist by training and expertise. I hang around a few and, and surely have worked in this area. Uh, I think we have a lot of questions left. First of all, is there such thing as durable immunity, period? Uh, I mean, the other side of the coin could be, will we ever have true immunity against this virus that lasts more than just a, a limited period of time? Uh, if we look at other coronaviruses, we surely have reason to believe that could be a challenge, that we may get some short-term immunity, but may not get long-term, whether it's B cell or T cell. Uh, and uh, so we have that side of the house that says, well, what could we get effective vaccines? Will we have people getting infected two, three, and four times will become a seasonal virus because of that very issue. So I think that we're somewhere between yes and no, <laughs> and we don't know where. Uh, uh, you know, and I think at this point, uh, it's fair to say that I'm more concerned about the fact that we won't get long-term immunity, that won't be durable, uh, and that we're going to have challenges with that. I would love it if, uh, in fact, T-cell immunity got us somewhere, but I think when you look at this virus, what it's doing right now, you know, where it has a chance to take off, it's taking off. I don't see any 
sudden magical rods from some T cells sitting in the reaction that's slowing it down. Uh, where it takes off, it really takes off. So if we don't have long-term immunity, uh, does that mean we could expect numbers on the order of what we're seeing right now annually, three, five, six million people infected? You know, we're in totally uncharted territories. Uh, this is one where it is difficult to say what will happen. Uh, maybe it'll be like influenza where you get vaccinated seasonally once a year or twice uh, every couple of years. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but I think we have to keep an open mind to all of this. And uh, we surely don't need to paint any more of a horrific uh, you know, concept than the fact that we may not achieve uh, some kind of permanent immunity. But I think we have to entertain that. Right now, I'd be very happy to settle for even short-term immunity if we could knock this thing down uh, around the world. Uh, this virus is extracting a huge price in so many countries right now, particularly right here in the Americas. Uh, it's, it's a huge issue. And uh, so uh, hopefully we can get durable immunity, both through natural infection and through vaccine. But if we can't, whatever we can get right now, we can sure use. Uh, I'm curious, you know, we're seeing in some states like Florida and Arizona, a real uh, uptick in cases. Uh, and yet in Massachusetts, New York, and some others, things are, are basically staying pretty low, uh, even though they've gone through multiple stages of reopening. Uh, can you explain why we're seeing that discrepancy? And do you expect a significant uptick in cases in uh, places like New York and Massachusetts? Well, one of the real lessons of uh, being part of COVID-19 is a word that isn't used nearly enough, and that's called humility. You have to acknowledge what you know and don't know and why you don't know it. So why certain areas have taken off like they have and other areas have been slower to take off, uh, we just don't understand why. Um, and I will say one thing though, that I think that uh, if you wait long enough, just any time that uh, someone says to you, well, look at how well they did it. They did it right. Sweden did it right. Uh, you know, uh, the New Zealand the Kiwis did it right, which they actually have to a large degree. Um, and then see what happens in short term. Uh, once this virus comes back, you have to stay right on top of it. And that's where the testing contact tracing comes back to play. Now, for areas that have not seen it reemerge yet, and I would add, as of this afternoon, I believe it was only Vermont and New Hampshire that had not seen level cases that were still decreasing. Uh, we had uh, seven states where it was level, otherwise everyone else is increasing. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll see what happens. I, I almost feel like, uh, you know, knock on wood when you say a state is level or decreasing that tomorrow it couldn't be seen a big increase. I remind people that, you know, the Floridians took kind of a victory lap uh, several weeks after they opened up in May, saying, look at how uh, well we've done here. We've not seen an increase. Uh, see, you can do that safely and look where they're at today. So, uh, you know, it's, I hate to say this, but these coronaviruses are almost, uh, you know, just wait a week and come back and talk to me and we'll see what we're going to talk about. I just want to remind our audience uh, later, uh, we're going to be having some time for Q&A. There's a little Q&A uh, button you can press at the bottom. Uh, if you submit your questions um, and we choose them, we're going to get many questions. We're going to invite you to become a panelist. You can come on audio and video uh, and ask your question directly. Uh, and also to do so, uh, please don't ask your question anonymously. Uh, we do want to know who you are. Um, so I want to ask you a question. As you're likely aware, Harvard announced this week that some students, uh, a maximum of 40%, will be on campus in the fall with significant restrictions, including classes being online, no in-person social gatherings, testing every three days, uh, daily self-reporting of symptoms, and quarantining when needed. Uh, most other universities are opening as well. I'm not sure about U of M. Uh, some with fewer restrictions. So is this safe? Uh, and should more students be invited back? Should schools be bringing any students back at all? Well, uh, again, from a public health perspective, let me just offer a final amendment here. Okay, nothing in the world is safe. Uh, it's safer, safe enough. Uh, it's a level of safety we're willing to accept. Uh, and I think that's the challenge right now is what is that level? How do we, how do we uh, look at that? If you're a young, healthy, 18-year-old uh, man or woman with no underlying health problems, you may have one very separate perspective on what the risk is of getting this infection and what it means to you. Uh, if you're a 57-year-old professor who has two underlying health problems that would both predispose you to serious outcome, 
you being on campus may have a very different perspective on what this is all about. And so one of the things we're trying to do right now is really deal with uh, an unknown. What will it be like uh, on August 15th or September 1st? Will it be a house on fire? Uh, will we be seeing case numbers sufficiently decreased? Uh, will young adults continue to contribute an inordinate amount of the transmission that we're seeing right now, largely associated with social events, indoor and outdoor, but mostly indoor? Um, and so I think all of these are really left up in the air. You know, my whole approach, and, and I have been advising some college presidents as well as, of course, my own here at the University of Minnesota, is flexibility, flexibility, flexibility. You know, we are, we are going to have to take things day by day as they come. If I had said to you four weeks ago, we'd be where we're at today with 60 some thousand cases newly reported today, potentially moving to 100,000 or more, you would have said, what? No, 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 we're, we're, we're seeing cases drop. You know, we're getting down below 20,000. You know, it's gonna go down. And, uh, you know, just a few thousand cases a day. And now look where we're at. So one of the challenges we're gonna have is, what are the conditions on the ground in your community on the day you're supposed to open. And I think that's the challenge we don't know. So I, I commend any institution that has multiple uh, uh, approaches. I think the idea would be to get back on campus as much as we can. Uh, you know, I surely support that. Education is an incredibly, incredibly valuable asset to the entire world. Uh, I surely want to see our foreign students with us. I think that they are a very important part of the collective educational experience uh, for both them and for us. And I see that we have to protect those uh, that are gonna be working on campus who might not be in the same position as a lot of young students. And so um, to answer your question, any one thing right now isn't the answer. It's gonna be a collection of, uh, of activities that are gonna help us uh, deal with this issue. Um, you know, what role testing plays, what role uh, residential life plays in terms of how many do you room with, what are the, you know, the requirements around, how do you stay isolated as much as you can, what happens if a case does occur, how do you do contact tracing, uh, you know, what are the risk issues, how do you run a classroom uh, when you only have limited space, you know, I know Harvard's Harvard, but I don't think they have 13 extra buildings sitting somewhere waiting for occupation uh, by students who otherwise wouldn't be there, but for COVID. And so I think these are all the challenges we have left to do, to deal with. And so even if university campuses, and this is going to depend on the university, are somewhat self-contained uh, and the population of students is at lower risk, uh, it likely means with campuses reopening that many, many young people are going to be flying to get to their campuses. Uh, from what I've read, a lot of the uptick in cases is concentrated in a younger demographic. Uh, so even if these students themselves might be okay, are you concerned uh, with these students getting on planes, potentially spreading infection, um, and that, you know, creating more of a forest fire in the, the locations to where they're traveling? Yeah, I surely can't say that air flight is safe, completely safe. Uh, I think that's a challenge. Uh, my biggest concern based on what we're seeing right now is what happens when they get to campus and hit the bars. Uh, if they're still open. That's where we see so many events, you know, frat parties, sorority parties, uh, bars. Uh, I mean, and we have an endless number of uh, outbreaks right now that is, have occurred in the last month, all associated with those kinds of events. Uh, you know, and it's not just in college age students, we're seeing in high school students. So we have some right here in the, in the state of Minnesota that have been remarkable outbreaks that occurred. Uh, so, so I, that's the challenge we have. And again, I would say that for the vast majority of young healthy adults, this is surely not a good thing to get, but your likelihood of having a life-threatening serious illness is surely a lot lower than those who are older or who have underlying health problems, but you're in contact with people like that. And so the, the spillover is what I really worry about and how that may impact in terms of severe disease and, and death. Uh, do you think we may see some states actually uh, not allowing colleges to reopen if the schools themselves have deemed it safe? Um, in terms of not allowing bars, you say? Or just not allowing uh, students to come back to campus? Oh, I don't think, I think they'll let that happen. I think that will happen. Uh, I think that we're all going to be looking to schools for their leadership uh, and how they handle it, uh, what they do. 
And uh, again, you know, the bigger issue for an individual community, I think, will be the K through 12. Because, and for most communities, that's where, uh, you know, their everyday lives are at, or in the K through 12. Now, they surely may work at a college or university uh, in living in that community, but uh, I think that's going to be different than, you know, do we get our high schools, grade schools, even our daycares open again? Oh, great. Thank you. Uh, shifting a little bit, um, can you talk a little bit about mutations in the virus? I know the variant and the spike protein, D16, uh, D614, yeah. and, and kinds of mutations we may see in the future. Are these mutations likely to make the virus more or less dangerous? Well, let me just say at the outset again, I'm not a coronavirus virologist, okay? So what you're getting here is at best uh, what I've learned at the, at the foot of some of the better virologists that way. I think the answer is we don't know. Um, clearly, I've not seen any data, nor do I'm aware of any that uh, actually s supports from a clinical standpoint or epidemiologic standpoint that the mutational changes we've seen to date have either somehow uh, impacted on the level of transmission uh, that occurs in our communities, nor have I seen data that supports that there's increased virulence or pathogenicity with the virus, the ability to cause severe disease or disease in general. Um, definitely the viruses are mutating, they're changing. Uh, but I think that in the ways that we think about that change, it's different than, for example, with influenza virus, where when that changes, it does have the capability of changing uh, how it in, in, in interfaces with the human body, the immunology of the relationship. So I just don't think we know at this point uh, what's happening. We have to stay open to anything that comes up with this virus. But right now, nothing that would say, oh my, we're really in trouble now because of increased transmission as has been suggested by some, uh, or that it's uh, killing more effectively or causing more severe disease uh, because of the issue around uh, uh, you know, changes. The one area I would say that I think deserves a lot more work, I mentioned earlier about healthcare workers and how important uh, it is to understand what they've been exposed to. And uh, while there's some very limited data, and I would say it's limited, and I want to qualify that by saying that, uh, that dose may play a very important role in the severity of disease, and that some healthcare workers have clearly had uh, exposure to much higher doses of virus in their work environments, uh, which might lead to a higher level of severe disease in the otherwise similar population not working in healthcare. I think that's been a, that's been a huge issue. Hmm. Um, pretty something which I think will be of interest to a lot of people uh, in our community, uh, the Jewish community. A lot of people um, on this call are thinking about uh, high holiday services in September. And obviously a lot can change between now and then. Uh, but as things currently stand, uh, what do you think about such services, either indoor with social distancing and restricted attendance or outdoors with uh, social distancing? Well, let me first uh, break apart the indoor-outdoor issue. I think that's an important one. Um, right as the protests were going on uh, following the, the horrible killing here in Minneapolis uh, with George Floyd, um, everyone was ready to jump on the bandwagon saying, oh, oh boy, this is going to be really a problem with increased transmission. And, you know, and I was quoted multiple times again trying to demonstrate the unnecessary humility that I at least had to bring to this table is I didn't know. And I laid out the fact that uh, surely crowds coming close together, yelling, screaming, aerosolizing events, uh, exposure to tear gas and to smoke causing coughing events, you'd expect to see some substantial transmission. But on the other hand, it was outdoors. And we know that the virus dissipates much more quickly with air movement as such, and with the potential for, for uh, in, during the daytime at least with sunlight, et cetera, and what impact it would have. And so I said, well, there's pluses and there are minuses. It wouldn't surprise me if there was little to no transmission increase or if there were a fair amount. We didn't know. Well, as we now know, uh, the data all supports there was very limited transmission. I'm waiting to see more data from the LA experience where they claim they may have some data related to the protests, but I can tell you in our own community, uh, we didn't see any evidence of that at all. And I know at least two other ones the same way. So we know that outdoor activity uh, by itself can be a better place to have human contact. Now, having said that, still distance is the most important thing. 
you know, just like in real estate, location, location, location. And if you want to prevent COVID-19 transmission, it's distance, distance, and distance. So outdoors, distance is by far a much better place to be. Indoors, you got a problem and challenge. Uh, there's an article in today's New York Times I'd refer everyone to listing all the recent church outbreaks that have occurred. Uh, a combination of services where all, everyone wore a mask in the church. Uh, and yet uh, there was a sizable notable outbreak that occurred with, associated with that service. Uh, singing was involved in some cases. Uh, so I think that anytime you bring people together indoors, uh, that is uh, exactly the, the situation. I was asked a question one night uh, on one of the national cable show, news shows, uh, and I have worked hard to stay out of the partisan politics on this, just stay with the science, make sure that, uh, you know, as objective as possibly can be. And I was asked the question, you know, would I be willing to attend uh, the president's uh, rally in Tulsa uh, that night? And of course, I knew where the interviewer was going. And so my answer was, look at if the four original Beatles showed up tonight in an indoor concert, I wouldn't go. Okay, so I mean, I think that's the, that's the message right now. I would find it very difficult to be indoors with a crowd of people like that, even if it was a church service, uh, as you just described. Uh, so you mentioned uh, the protests, and I want to turn to a question, it's a little bit long, so uh, bear with me. Uh, but in the preface to your 2020 edition uh, of the book, Deadliest Enemy, you write, and I'm quoting, the first responsibility of the president or the head of any nation is to offer accurate and up-to-date information provided by public health experts, not gender-oriented public operatives. Uh, we've certainly seen political leaders offer advice that contradicts that of public health experts, uh, but potentially we've also seen political views influence public health officials. Uh, in a Times opinion piece this week, Michael Powell contrasting health officials' responses to conservative anti-lockdown protests and to the responses to Black Lives Matter protests wrote, and I'm quoting, was public health advice in a pandemic dependent on whether people approve of, mass gathering, of the mass gathering in question? To many, the answer seemed to be yes. And then he goes on to quote Mark Lurie, who's an epidemiologist at Brown, who says, instinctively, many of us in public health feel a strong desire to act against accumulated generations of racial injustice. But we have to be honest, a few weeks before, we were criticizing protesters for arguing to open up the economy and saying that was dangerous behavior. Um, so my question uh, for you is, uh, there are many good reasons to say that the risks in protesting are ultimately worth riding this wave of change in our country. But if that subtlety becomes lost on the American public, how concerned are you that epidemiologists, experts like yourself, will lose the trustworthiness vital to have an influence on people's behavior and ultimately the course of the pandemic? Yeah, I think that's a very fair question. And I think it's a very critical question. Um, and that's why, as I prefaced one of my previous comments, is I have uh, tried my very best to just stay straight with the science, let the science speak for itself. Uh, that becomes very evident when it uh, doesn't match up with what's being said by whoever from whatever uh, uh, party. Uh, you know, I've had roles in the last five presidential administrations, including this one. I was a citizen science envoy for the State Department for a year, uh, two years ago, traveled around the world, I represented the U.S. government. Um, I was state epidemiologist here in Minnesota at the Minnesota Department of Health for a number of years. I served two Democratic governors, two Republican governors, one independent governor. And, you know, people could not tell you my partisan politics. My job was to serve is with accurate information, timely information. And if I uh, had a point of view, I put it forward without regard to, uh, you know, who was listening, if I thought that that was the science answer for the day. And I'm gonna keep doing that. Uh, I think right now, uh, if we have our messages get lost in partisan politics, which are real, no doubt about it, they're important, but uh, somebody hopefully can help stay, be for, you might say, the neutral judge of this. and and let the science speak for itself. If I'm motivated by anything, I'm motivated by the truth and, uh, and flavored by humility because of, again, as I've stated already, uh, the things I don't know, uh, to, to more days not that outnumber the things that I know. Oh, thank you so much uh, for your candor. We're gonna turn now to some uh, audience questions. Uh, we'll begin with Ted Tapper. Ted is an alum and a physician, a good friend of my mother's and I believe is in Philadelphia. Ted, uh, you should be <laughs> unmuted. You can go ahead and ask your question. 
Can't hear it. Help if I got my microphone on. Can you hear me now? I yeah. can. Thank you very much. Good to see you. Um, I I have two questions. One, and, and both of these may fall into the basket of humility on your part. One <laughs> is, is there anything known about the genome that would have a individual with a proclivity or a non-proclivity for having a serious disease. And the other is sort of the same thing. Other than viral load, which you alluded to with some of the healthcare workers and genetic predisposition, are there any risk factors known that would make one individual more prone to serious illness or less prone to serious illness? Well, um... Let me say that again, I, I'm not uh, a geneticist on this issue and uh, from a, either from an agent standpoint or from a human standpoint. Let me make a couple of points though. First of all, there are risk factors that we're not talking about, which I find uh, challenging coming from the public health world. Uh, two of the areas where we know that we have challenges right now are, uh, and this includes all ages, not just the older population, is obesity and smoking. And both are risk factors for which we in public health should be loud and clear about uh, why we're doing everything we can to encourage, if there was ever a time uh, to address both of those issues it's right now. Uh, they're something that's just front and center and yet I don't hear much about those. Uh, the second thing is uh, the issues of course of so many of the chronic diseases we have do have genetic components. Now, is that a direct cause and effect to the virus, or is it the, you know, the issue of hypertension, cardiovascular disease, renal disease, uh, play a role, um, and and how they play a role in the genetics? We don't know. You know, immunologically, we know that our immune systems and our our history, uh, what's been passed down to us, are often very much related, and uh, whether that also means even in some cases gender related. Uh, race issues, uh, ethnicity, you know, what is social cultural, what is, is actually physiologic. So I, I'm not qualified to speak to all those, but I can tell you that it's an area that we really need to desperately address. Uh, we just put out a document today from our Center on Disease Surveillance and COVID-19 Surveillance and how little we really know about racial disparities right now and how we should be knowing about that, but we have such poor surveillance data to understand what part of it is environment, what part of it is genetics, what part of it is access to medical care. So I, th I think the bottom line message is there are those things, but I am sure genetics are playing a, an important role here. Uh, and it's just a matter of figuring that out uh, of, of over time what that means. But right now it's not known. It's not known to that I know. I mean, immunologically, we understand that people who have certain pre-existing immunologic conditions may have a higher risk, but what's the cause and effect and how that relates? I, I, I can't say, I don't know. Does cytokine storm play any role ever? Cytokine storm is very important. Uh, and what, what's challenging about these patients, and this is if you were to ask a clinician about this, uh, you know, you get five healthy young people into your office who are infected do a chest x-ray on them and you'll find, even though they're relatively healthy, they'll have the broken glass radiograph that makes people wonder, wow, you're healthy and you don't feel it? How can this be the case? You have that all the way to the extreme of where you see these vasculitis, the stroking issue, you know, the hematologic conditions, all the things there that make you concerned that this is part of an immunologic profile, like cytokine storm. You know, we've known about cytokine storms you know, for, for a century, uh, yet we can't quite understand why some people are predisposed. Influenza and cytokine storms have been a very classic uh, combination. We surely have seen it here, but we've had many patients that have not had cytokine storms that uh, have been unclear as to what it actually, you know, why some get it and some don't. Thank Ed, you very much. Thank you. thank you. It's good to see you. I see you, Dan. Uh, we're going to turn to Sarah Horn. Sarah's a, a recent alumna, uh, is now uh, doing a, a graduate degree in psychology at Furkoff in New York. Sarah, it's great to see you and go ahead and you can unmute yourself and ask your question. You're good. Okay, cool. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so hi. I was wondering, uh, hi. 
if you could speak a little bit more to the research on antibodies for COVID-19, um, do we have any idea of how long they last? Is there evidence that people have already gotten infected a second time? Um, and how will that impact the potential for herd immunity? Um, do antibodies have to last indefinitely to develop herd immunity or um, can there be variations in that? Yeah. Great question. And first of all, can I just add that the question you didn't ask, which I thought you were going to ask because of your background, is the psychological impacts of COVID-19, and they're dramatic. Okay, yeah. so we need you right now. If there's an area that needs to be addressed, it's the psychological toll that this disease is taking. And uh, I, you know, I, I think, again, I'd start with our healthcare workers, pick those in the intensive care units, the post-traumatic stress is just beyond description. So, so we need you. Okay. So keep, keep working in this area. Um, in terms of the antibodies, um, let me just say that again, this is an area that is so ripe for, uh, for study. I, um, I can tell you that, you know, talking again to my colleagues who really have studied their whole lives, uh, coronaviruses, the immunology, will tell you based on what we know about SARS and MERS, we are, are challenges to know that we're going to have long-term durable immunity. And as the question was asked earlier, a very good one about T cell, B cell, you know, what does it mean if you lose neutralizing antibodies uh, from a detectability standpoint after 12 weeks? What does that mean? We don't know. And, uh, and this has huge implications for vaccines. It has huge implications for what happens with durable immunity slash herd immunity. Do we accomplish it? Do we get it temporarily? Uh, and, and these are all challenge questions that we just don't know the answers to, but they're huge. As far as um, uh, the issue around herd immunity and what it means is, is that we could you know, temporarily get there in the sense of you know, if I have protection for one, two years, and we surely have some infectious diseases like that, where we get some short-term immunity, you know, we could get a temporary there, uh, uh, kind of level of protection, but not long-term. As far as people having second illnesses, I am not aware of anyone who has actually demonstrated second infections. We have had a lot of confusion that is now getting cleared up, and I'm urging every journal editor in a moment, I'll tell you what I'm urging them to do, is that PCR, which has been well known for you know, a long time with a number of viral infections where people shed viral debris long after the last viable virus is there. And so what happens is that somebody may recover, uh, they may have some ongoing symptoms of something because we're surely seeing kind of a post COVID-19 syndrome right now where some people still remain uh, you know, with some symptoms but no evidence of ongoing viral uh, replication. And so what happened, and this really started in the Korean CDC, they did a study where they were following 300 and plus people, uh, and they kept finding, you know, on, on testing uh, by PCR, positivity. Well, so what? You know, and so many of us encouraged them to stop doing that only and do virus culture at the same time. And sure enough, after day 10 to 14, none of these people were positive and for virus but they shed the, uh, the uh, um, PCR positivity for some time. And we actually had instances where somebody might go uh, two negatives and then get a positive again. And so they, of course, immediately interpreted that to mean you're reinfected. And with further work, it was shown that no, there was no evidence of reinfection. And I'm not aware of anyone yet. Now, um, having said that, if in fact we don't get durable immunity, maybe at eight months, 12 months, you know, 14 months post illness, we may get a second infection, we just don't know. And that's, that's the huge challenge. I mean, this is part of, we have so much to learn about this virus and the human population yet. It's, you know, I, I feel like we're drinking from a fire hose uh, right now in terms of knowledge and, uh, and we got a lot more to go. So thank you. Thank you, yeah, I mean, I guess presumably we can infer that it's gonna last at least a few months because people have I assume, been re-exposed since getting it. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you recover. I mean, first of all, you recover. If you didn't have an immunologic response, you could, might argue that some people, you know, a lot of people wouldn't recover. And so, you know, what, what does that mean? And we know early, actually, in illness, uh, you can get neutralized an antibody fairly early into your illness course. So it does happen. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Eric, great to see you. Thank you for the question. Uh, we are going to turn now to Ludwig Semensky from the medical school. Can you go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question? 
Good evening. I had to unmute myself. I thought that you would be reading it. My question was, uh, are there any reports uh, or what is the thinking about the effect of this infection on pregnant women, particularly on the uh, fetus? Uh, the yeah. This has been around for a while, so I imagine that women who were infected in early stage of pregnancy already delivered the child. Well, thank you for that question. It happens to be a very personal question for me. My daughter is a neonatologist and is actually the medical director of the NICU unit at the University of Minnesota Hospital. And uh, that is the designated center for pregnant women uh, with, dis with uh, COVID-like illness and distressed pregnancies to come to in case they need to deliver early. And so that's been a challenge. Um, I think right now the verdict is out on this. There is no clear, compelling evidence that there uh, has been, to my knowledge, any, uh, ev uh, any situation where someone has had COVID-19 and either had pregnancies uh, where the child suffered some kind of, uh, of, of serious health issue like we might see with Zika or any other uh, issue like that. I'm not aware of increased uh, spontaneous abortions, et cetera. Um, uh, and I know that people are studying this issue right now to understand what does this do. Now, clearly, anyone who has a serious illness, we know that if you're pregnant and you're also experiencing the same kind of illness that would potentially be fatal if you weren't pregnant, uh, you know, that's going to be a compromising situation for the pregnancy. Again, fortunately, uh, you know, this is a disease that is relatively mild for most women of childbearing age. And so we haven't seen, I think, uh, the large number of, uh, of cases of very serious illness in women uh, who at the same time were pregnant and delivering. Uh, I'm not aware of any here in Minnesota that have had a complication that uh, as a result of it, uh, you know, there was some serious challenge with uh, the pregnancy or uh, the child. But, uh, you know, again, this is an area I, I can't say that I can say that uh, what else is going on. I am old enough to live through the rubella uh, epidemics uh, before the vaccine became, uh, you know. And uh, for many years afterwards, we saw some not so severe influence on a child, but enough of that. Yeah. That's why I started to think about that. No, that's a very good point. And as you know, CMV today, I mean, there were surely a number of viral agents that we worry a lot about. Uh, Zika right now, I'm quite involved with Zika research. And uh, that is a huge challenge, a huge challenge today. So, so your, your question's right on the mark. I mean, it's a very important one, uh, but I'm not aware at this point of a, from a coronavirus standpoint, other than the clinical condition of the mother, that there is some unique risk factor to the unborn child. But thank you for the question. Thank you, thank you for your questions. Good to see you. Uh, we're gonna turn now uh, to Amy Simon, uh, an alumna of the college. Amy, go ahead and ask your question. Hi, um, thank you so much for um, this very edifying talk. And um, I'm also a pulmonary and critical care doctor um, and also doing research on coronavirus and, and echo all you're saying about how we keep learning new things every day. So it's very humbling. Well, yeah, um, thank you for being on the front lines. Uh, it's people like you that uh, we really owe a great deal to for what you're doing. Well, actually, I have to just have a disclosure, which is right now I'm developing a drug for coronavirus, um, more so than being on the front lines, but I also still see patients. Um, but anyway, um, my question to you is, knowing what we know about vaccine development and thinking that the earliest one would be available is maybe 2021, January, how long do you think this whole phase three is going to keep lasting before we can actually meaningfully give up our masks and get back to going to the Beatles concerts that you'd like to see if they were there. Um, because it, it, it just feels that we have a lot of work ahead of us and um, being able to get the vaccine to enough people to get herd immunity, assuming that it will work, um, won't necessarily be quick. So I just want to hear what you, yeah, right. you had a crystal yeah. ball. No, well, thank you. I, I, I don't, but let me just share with you. First of all, if I get that in Beatle invitation, I'll send you a copy. Okay. Um, uh, 
uh, right now, this is one of those uncharted territories where I worry a bit that we have been overpromising in a way that the public is expecting us to deliver on something I'm not sure we can at, in the time. Um, this is not going to be a simple situation. Already, we had a, a time course that was laid out with the idea that we'd have vaccine by the uh, end of this year. And then you saw the Moderna trial, which was the leading trial of U.S. vaccines, now get moved back for phase three. Uh, originally supposed to be July 9th, and now I understand it may be early August before we see that launched. You know, anytime you have that kind of, of delay, you're going to, you know, just keep pushing it back. But I think the real challenge is um, what are we going to accept for a vaccine? If it works 50% of the time, is that good enough? Is it 70% of the time? And who does it work in? Does it work in those who are most likely to have severe disease? How are we going to study that? Right now, we're studying in young, healthy adults because of the protocols as such to do that. Yet uh, we know that that's the group that we probably have overall, you know, other than young children, the least need for a good effective vaccine in terms of severe outcomes. So I think there's gonna be a lot of challenges that way to figure out what it means. The second thing is gonna be just as the good questions already about durability. You know, we're not gonna have a clue about durability uh, initially, and nor should we expect it to be, but we're going to follow that over time. What if this happens to go from a vaccine that needs, uh, you know, one injection every 10 years, if that five years to one that needs one every year, uh, you know, it's going to fundamentally change the whole program. So I think that we've got a ways to go. My concern is also safety. Um, you know, whoever came up with Operation Warp Speed, that was the worst name in the world they could have come up with. You know, it just engendered, I think, that sense by some who are, you know, anti-vaccine pro to say, you know, see, they're just going to skip on safety. And I think that was really, a, a, you know, not a good name. Safety is going to be key. If we have one event with this vaccine, I think it could have a tremendous implication for vaccines for a long time to come, much like swine flu did back in 1976. So I think phase three also from a safety standpoint, how many do you really need to have to not only show effectiveness, but also safety and what level of safety? So I think we still have a ways to go there. I also worry a lot about the supply chains for actually, you know, a vaccine is a vaccine, but it doesn't matter. It's a vaccination that counts. If you don't get it into somebody, it doesn't do anything. And so where are the syringes going to be? Where are our bottles going to be? Where are all the diluents? Everything else we need, you know, do we have that? And we're learning now from a PPE standpoint in healthcare. We all thought we had these supply chains. We're going to gear up. Look how, what rough shape we're in today. You just can't materialize these things overnight. It takes machines to build machines that make machines. Look at the issue right now with testing. We have major shortages of reagents. We have all kinds of problems, supply chains again. So, I mean, think about the world. There are 8 billion people that want this vaccine. And how much of it are going to be able to produce? Not just in the United States, but think about where glass vials might come from. Might not, might not come from the United States. Well, who else wants those glass vials? The Chinese do. The Indians do. You know, the, e, the EU do. And so we're in competition for those same supplies. So part of it is, does the vaccine work? Who does it work in? For how long does it work? Some of those questions, we're going to get a license before we know. Is it safe? How much safety data we actually have to have before we'll say, okay, it's good enough to go through. And then finally, do we actually have the system put in place to give it? I have to tell you, you know, I've already had some uh, challenging conversations with uh, friends and colleagues who I make the point, I think healthcare workers should be right up at the top of the list with those who are caring for COVID patients. You know, they're in harm's way every day. And I get the pushback, oh, you're just taking care of your own, you know, you know, it should go somewhere else. And so I think we're going to have a lot of work yet to do to figure out where it goes. So, so I'm with you. I don't know when. I could only hope next year that something will be available. Um, you know, every day we don't have one is just one more day that this virus is burning away at human wood out there. And, uh, and anybody who's ever spent any time in an ICU gets it completely. So thank you for your work. Thank you, Amy. Uh, we're going to turn now uh, to Joel Kaminsky, who's a, an alum of the Divinity School and a professor at Smith College. Uh, Joel, it's nice to see you. You can go ahead and uh, just ask you to unmute yourself, and hopefully you can do that and ask your question. 
I'm not an alum of the Divinity School, but I did teach there once. No, I'm sorry. Okay. But I'm a student of John Levinson's, but from University of Chicago. <laughs> That's the connection. That's good enough. Anyway, my, my, my question is, how do we balance the damage that we're doing by shutting down the increased amount of depressions, suicides, abuse, um, abuse or even just students little kids in school losing their rhythm, losing their education. How do we balance that against the fact that, generally speaking, a lot of society is not that vulnerable? I mean, in Massachusetts, 65% of the deaths have occurred in nursing homes or assisted living facilities where they've actually been pretty careful, but yet mm -hmm. it's been a horrible result. So how do we lock up the right parts of society and not lock down everyone, which is having huge social costs that could be equivalent to 800,000 deaths. Yeah. You know, um, you asked a trillion dollar question and it's a, it's a critical one. Um, I would uh, add a friendly amendment to your comments that uh, this is an evolution. And what I mean by that is the, as you pointed out that there are some areas where very few people have been impacted and why would we shut down those areas when, in fact, the damage that is being done is clear and compelling? And I'll come back to that in a moment. But let me also say that uh, as this virus continues to move through society, um, there won't be blue states and red states or blue counties and red counties. They're all going to be COVID colored. I come from rural Iowa uh, where, you know, it's remote, it's far away, it's a flyover land. Uh, we've had outbreaks where somebody went on a vacation last January, brought a virus back to this little county uh, from where they were at on their vacation. Uh, a little meat packing plant in one part of the county brought it in, and suddenly this county was on fire. And uh, it, it wasn't distant. It wasn't just in congregate living or congregate work areas. Uh, to date, most of the deaths have occurred in congregate, particularly living long-term care. Part of that is the fact that if you have one in 500 people in your community who is infected, if that one person visits a nursing home as a, as a family member, relative, or they work there, suddenly it's like putting a match to a gas can. Boosh, all of a sudden you have all these cases. And those initially contributed substantially, just as did congregate work areas like meatpacking plants, prisons, uh, even cruise ships. And what's happening is the, as the pandemic is evolving, and we're seeing this right now in the southern states, where all these young, healthy adults are getting it, for which, by the way, there is an increasing number who are severely ill and who are dying as a result of this, because they're getting also even there, the obesity epidemic overlaps in younger individuals. So over time, uh, this isn't going to be locked up in congregate care, uh, et cetera. We're going to see it spread through society in a way that many places will be impacted. But I agree with you right now, it's not there. But the point you raise about the damage is a huge one. It is a huge one. Um, you know, I think when we get it all done, I, I worry, and I've said this on multiple occasions, I look at the lack of childhood immunizations going on right now. You know, family practice docs, uh, practitioners, nurses, uh, pediatricians are trying to get their kids vaccinated but we just lost six months. And I can tell you right here in Minnesota, we administered 34% fewer MMR vaccine doses for the same 10, week 10 to week 25 of 2020 than we did in 2019. Um, I worry that in the next six to 12 months, we're gonna have more deaths in this country due to measles from kids than we are from COVID-19 because of missed opportunities in that very area. And we could go through, you and I could probably go through and list 20 other areas, whether it's mental illness, uh, whether it's uh, uh, sex abuse, sexual abuse, whether it's uh, e even just classic uh, food availability, uh, you know, nutrition. Um, and so I think that one of the things we have to do is figure that out and say, okay, what do we do to address that? At the same time, we got to bring this virus down or else the implications are even more far reaching. And I, I don't have a perfect answer for you, but I think it's one that wasn't thought through very well at the beginning of this last lockdown. It was kind of like, we got to get her down, get it down, shave off the curve. Oh, and oh, by the way, this is lasting a lot longer than we thought. And I think the implications have been huge. 
So um, I, I just would validate your point and I hope that you and I aren't one day, you know, looking at the same data where X number of kids have died from measles um, than did uh, from COVID-19. Last thing I just add to that, there have been several really well done reports, even some work out of your own community here, uh, is the impact that this has had on other uh, care needs, heart attacks, strokes, et cetera, where people were too afraid to go in, uh, didn't get in in a timely way, or just didn't get good access to care. And you know the number of deaths that are COVID related, but not caused by COVID, I think when we get that all added up is gonna be substantial. Thank you. Thank you. Joe, thank you for your question. We're gonna to turn to our final question for the evening. Uh, Andrew Evans is uh, herself an alumna of Harvard and the mother of Clara. Uh, so it is nice to see you. Uh, you're right Go ahead. Hey, great. Uh, please, please ask your question. Uh, my question is actually the, the flip side to, to the answer that you just gave, which is um, we've got to make a decision um, as, a, as a city, as a state, and I have to make a decision as a parent um, about sending my kid back to school. Um, we're just a month away from that. Um, cases are rising significantly in Los Angeles, uh, and the idea of sending my children, along with all the other children from across the city, to a place where they're going to be indoors for extended periods of time. Yes, they're wearing masks, but still, it's um, it's a it's a tight space, uh, K through 12. How do we just? I know that we have to justify it in terms of mental health, in terms of continuing their education, but how do we justify it with the rise in the number of cases and now deaths in, uh, in Los Angeles and elsewhere. Yeah. Um, well, I, I can't speak to this as a parent, but I can as a grandparent, okay? My kids are older, so, but I've got kids in the same boat, grandkids in the same boat as you. So this is one that I actually have both hats on at the same time. I feel it. I feel your pain is my pain too. Um, I think two things are really important here. One is that, uh, what happens in the community right now is a, the underlying foundation whether schools can open or not. I think that uh, when you look at the experience in Europe and Asia and people talk about the favorable outcomes, they're all based on at the time, quite low levels of transmission in the community. Mm -hmm. And we're not facing that for many communities right now. No, some we are, some, you know, we're still in pretty good shape here in some places in Minnesota after really fighting this thing down, but hopefully it will stay that way. But as you pointed out, in many communities, that's not the case. And so to me, that's almost the uh, original determining factor. If it's not under control in your communities, it's much harder to think about opening schools uh, for a variety of reasons. But the second thing is, is that you know there is a price to pay, just as the last question was for not doing it, as you pointed out. And, um, I would break that down between K through eight and nine through 12. Um, I've worked on too many outbreaks where nine through 12, just because they're not in school, doesn't mean they're not together. Uh, and in fact, uh, I worked up a very large outbreak of meningitis in a high school here in Minnesota. And I wanted desperately to keep the kids all together in the school, not let them out for it. But the parents said, oh no, any risk is too great. But we knew that this particular bacteria was spread through saliva, contact, okay? The chances of swapping spit as such in school was a lot less than it was outside in the community. So the next day after closing the school, I have a picture of 12 young junior girls from the high school at the local McDonald's sharing two different McDonald's glasses of pop among the 12. Okay, I mean, I could not have invented a more effective way to transmit it. So I think when we get to you know eight through 12, it gets a little bit more complicated. They're going to be together anyway. And so the chances of actually somehow changing that risk is a little bit different. But I think under age eight or, or eighth grade, it is different. Now we have to look at, I look at it in four buckets. One is what is the safety and the issues around the cost of not having education for the kids themselves? How do you balance all of that? The second one is, how do you balance the safety and the uh, ability for the teachers, the, the support staff, the administration to work in that environment, particularly now that they may be at higher risk of having a bad outcome. Then you get to the family members. 
you know, we forget about the fact that families have high risk people. And so our kids at higher risk going to school and bringing it home to whoever might be living at home, including grandpa or grandma and, and or a sib with an underlying health problem. And then the fourth one is just to the community in general, which is, you know, a much in some way easier to deal with because it, it's, it's everywhere. So I think you raise a really important point. And I can say right now, I feel confident that the risk of disease in kids, young kids is actually very, very small. I can't say it's safe any more than I can tell you if you put them on a school bus, that a semi wasn't gonna hit them at the next red light and, you know, and, and seriously injure them or kill them. It's not, not the world is just not a safe place, but it can be safer. I feel like these kids are going to be uh, at very, very low risk, and they have a much higher risk for a lot of other outcomes that we wouldn't keep them from going. But the challenge is, as an epidemiologist, my entire career is based on risk. And risk is a two-factor issue, a numerator and a denominator. And so, you know, I can say how many people would get this out of this many people or whatever, except for one area, and that's young kids. It's all numerator. It's all numerator. There's no denominator. One child gets seriously on a school, and I'll promise you right now that school will shut down. That's just the way people react. And so what we have to do is help them get through this by knowing that, you know, whether they're at home and they get this or they're in school, it's going to be a challenge. So, but my first point coming back to is if the community is not in a place because of the large number of cases, then I don't see how a school can open. And uh, I do a weekly podcast. The next week's podcast is just on uh, school opening and how to address it and so forth. And it also is based on, there are now at least 11 different uh, groups that have come forward with recommendations on how to open and close schools, including the American Academy of Pediatrics, et cetera. So we're trying to meld all those into one uh, thing. So I'm not sure I satisfactorily answered your question, but uh, it's a process we're all thinking about. And as a grandparent, I can tell you with absolute certainty, I think about it a lot. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, thank we have, you. We have many other questions, but I'm afraid that our time is up. Dr. Osom, yeah. thank you so much. Well, thank you. Uh, it's a great, great set of group. Thank you. It was good all to see you. I appreciate that, and I appreciate the invitation. It was very kind of you. It's wonderful to see you and to learn from you. I highly encourage everyone to uh, follow you um, in your print writing uh, online, anywhere you can find Dr. Osom. Please check out his book, Deadliest Enemy. It, it sheds a lot of insight both on this pandemic uh, and unfortunately future ones that you are, are currently predicting. And hopefully uh, we will learn our lessons in the near future. In the meantime, uh, God bless. I, I wish you uh, health and safety uh, and to all of our listeners as well. Uh, we have a few other uh, programs you. coming up. Um, look for those in your email, but in particular, our Pardis Sabeti is a computational biologist here at Harvard who has uh, modeled uh, disease infection in uh, Harvard's campus, or she will have a lot to share uh, about uh, Harvard's reopening plans, um, amongst others. So you'll, you'll find uh, invitations to those in your inbox. Um, have a wonderful evening, Dr. Osterholm. Uh, Thank and you. The rest of you, and hope to see you soon. Bye. Thanks. Um